open to Luke chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11. Now this uh, chapter picks up and takes off after Jesus has just come out of his wilderness experience of 40 days and 40 nights of being tempted by the devil in the wilderness. That's in chapter 4 and you can read about it later some other time. But we come into chapter 5 and now he begins to really call out uh, his disciples, his followers of them and he's going to have an encounter with Peter but not the first time or the second. Matter of fact, this is the third time that Jesus has uh, come encountered with Peter. And uh, we're going to see he's going to give Peter a test to see if Peter can pass the test. And so we're going to see if we can pass the test tonight that the Lord's going to give to us. So let's take a look at it in the beginning in verse number one. And it came to pass. Now, aren't you glad something came to pass? What came to pass? That as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. Now, anybody ever uh, experienced that? If you've preached the word or taught the word of God in any place and time, and we did in Africa, we know what that means when the crowd presses upon you. I mean, boy, they get right up all around you and in your face, and I mean, you're smothered to death if you're not careful. We had to get where we had to put ropes out where we could have some breathing room. So I can understand a little bit about what Jesus is going through here uh, when they came to hear the word of God and he stood by the lake, which is really, the, the, they call it a lake, Luke does here, but it's the Sea of Galilee, by the way, and saw two ships uh, standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing uh, their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down, and he taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep. Let down your nets for a drought. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. You notice uh, the will is involved in here, if you're paying attention there. When they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake, and they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished or amazed and all that were with him at the drought of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, that's mean the sons of thunder, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from hence thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to the land, they forsook all and followed him. Father, we thank you for tonight. Once again, we ask for your blessing upon your word. We ask once again your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide, that he will guide us into all truth. He will bring to remembrance the things that Jesus has said to us. He will give us illumination, understanding of the word. We ask that he would grant to us wisdom that we may apply the word which we receive tonight, that we would not just be hearers only, but doers of the word. And Lord, we thank you for what we're going to learn this evening. 
Pray that you will apply it to our lives so that we might serve you in a better way. Pray that we'll learn something. We might uh, be able to put it to use in our lives as we go through this and uh, this test that Peter is taking and the test that we're going to take. So, Father, we ask for your direction, for your help, and we ask for your anointing upon your servant this hour. Father, we cannot do it apart from you, and we depend on you and your Holy Spirit. And, Lord, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. Thanks for those that are watching. Pray that many will be blessed and touched by it. If there's someone who's never been saved, we ask you to save them tonight for Jesus' sake. And we'll give you all the praise and thanks and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Isn't it amazing how we read this story, if you learn anything from it, that aren't you amazed that God loves you? Aren't you amazed tonight that God wants you? And aren't you even amazed even more than that, that God wants to use you? What an amazement that God offers that. In the context here, as we take a look at it, in chapter 4, as I mentioned, we find that Jesus has power over demons. And we learned that this morning, amen? Demons know who Jesus is, by the way. Oh, boy, that they do. And he had just returned from a 40-day of testing of temptation in the wilderness. And now he's going to have a third encounter with Peter, by the way, and he's at the lake here, or the Sea of Galilee, we find in Luke chapter 1 and verse 5, and we find that the first time Jesus meets Peter, by the way, is found over in John's gospel, John chapter 1 in verses 40 through 42, is where John has been baptizing in the Jordan, and says, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, and if you read in verse 42 of John chapter 1, you find out that Peter's one of them. And you find out what happens in that story. You remember the story? And Andrew went and found his brother Peter and brought him to Jesus. And Peter changed his name. Amen. And so we praise God. Peter got saved with his first encounter with the Lord there in John chapter 1. And then again over in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19, Jesus meets the fellows again. And he says, hey, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now we come to Luke's gospel and account here in Luke chapter 5, and he's going to give Peter another chance to follow him. And this is the third time of this encounter, and aren't you glad God gives us a little more than one chance sometimes to follow him? Aren't you glad sometimes when he calls us and asks us to follow that sometimes we don't respond right away, do we? We, like most people, we come up with a lot of excuses and a lot of reasons why we can't. Too busy, haven't got enough time, and the list goes on and on. And you'll find uh, Peter has a little bit of problem with that in the story here as we take a look at it. And we all struggle with that, amen. Uh, But we're going to find that tonight as we take a look at it. Uh, So Jesus came to Peter in in the very day. He came into him in the midst of his life, of his activities, of his trade, uh, of his work. Jesus came to me. You know, we never know when Jesus is going to come to us. And he came to Peter right when he was busy doing his work, his business. He'd been fishing all night. They were tending to the nets, and then they were probably going to have a little breakfast perhaps and then go to sleep and get some rest and go back at it again the next day. But in this story, I see where Jesus asked Peter five questions, five tests he gives to Peter in this, uh, if we did. And the first test I want you to notice with me, we find with us is right off the bat. He comes to Peter, and he says, Peter, Will you give me your boat? Peter, will you give me your boat? What is it that God's asking of you tonight to give to him? God's going to ask you to give something. And here he asked Peter to give him his boat. Now you think about this for just a minute with me. What, What Peter is, Peter's a fisherman. He makes his living by fishing, doesn't he? He needs that boat. And now the Lord's asking him to give me the boat. Pretty tough question, isn't it? What's the Lord asking of you and I tonight that he wants us to give him? Could it be our livelihood? Could it be our profession? Could it be our business? I mean, what is it that God may be asking of you? You see, God can't use us because we're slaves to stuff. We're so geared to materialism and and having so much and hoarding it I mean, look at around. If you drive around this county long enough, you're going to see, what are we going to see? You're going to see storage facilities being built after everywhere. Why? Because people's garages are not for their car anymore. They're for their storage. 
And then that gets so full, they got to go rent and pay $40 to $60 plus to $100 a month to store stuff that they don't see and look at for 20 years. And then they die, and there's an auction goes up, and some of you can go, and Steve can go uh, uh, to the auction and bid on the, 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 the shelter there, uh, the storage shed, for $100, and opens it up, and there's an antique Corvette inside. Oh, has he struck it rich. But you might open it up and find a bunch of old ragged clothes and cockroaches and everything else in there. And you say, oh, me. But isn't that the truth? We have so much stuff. We've become a materialistic nation, a materialistic people, even a materialistic church today. Boy, churches have got, you name it, they're just like the Laodicean church. We've got everything. We've got the money. We've got the plan. We've got the program. We've got everything. We don't need God. And Jesus said, but you're naked and blind and wretched. And he said, you'd better buy of me. Now that's to the Laodicean church, and that's the church age we're living in. So thank God we, 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 we've kept what we've had here for 37 years. And so, you know what I'm saying? And uh, we'd rather spend our money. I mean, I would love to get rid of this peacock pews. I've wanted to get rid of these things for 20 years. And, and, and this dark, worn-out carpet. But praise God, he's made this carpet last 38 years. The same carpet, still going strong. Some few places it could be, uh, you know, worked out. But hey, you know what? But what do we do? Rather than spending, uh, I don't know, I've never redone pews, but I know it runs about 50 grand to redo pews. Call the man in Jacksonville that does it. You know, because this is only half of them. The other half are stored. <laughs> Amen. I'd rather spend $50,000 on the gospel and the television and the radio and the YouTube and the internet and, and, and Rumble and Facebook and get the gospel out to get people saved that has an eternal value to it than whether we get some new carpet and pews. So that's the way I feel about it. So praise God, not that I wouldn't like him and want him. And so when you die, don't leave me your uh, uh, story shed down here. Leave us money to repad and pew to church. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So you see, but that's the truth, isn't it? Peter, I want your boat. Now, wait a minute, God. Do you realize what you're asking of me? That's my livelihood. That's my business. And I'm in business with uh, James and John here. And, and this is how we make our living. This is how we feed our families. This is how we provide fish for the village. And you're asking me to give me the boat? Uh-huh. What's God asking you to give up tonight? Got to be something. May not be a boat. Could be something else. Could be finances. Could be who knows. I mean, you got to understand, the ship was Peter's livelihood. Jesus had interrupted his livelihood. He's asking him to literally give up his livelihood. Give up his trade. And come follow me and become a fisherman of men. Aren't you glad Peter went? Now, I'm not going to jump ahead of myself because we're going to look in the story here, all right? All right? And every teacher struggles with this. Every teacher that teaches the Word of God that's called into ministry struggles with this. I want you to leave Alaska, and I want you to go to work for somebody. I want you to leave a $100,000 a year job and go to work for $15,000 a year. Uh, you, you, you sure you got this right, God? Are you speaking to the right person? I want you to get rid of your house. You're not going to have a house to go to when you get there. You're not going to have a place to live in. But don't worry, I want, your, I want you to come to Florida. I want you to work for this man, and I want you to leave Alaska and everything it has. I want you to leave your church, leave your friends, leave everything. I want you to leave it all. Come and follow me. Okay. And we did. Wasn't long after that. I want you to go to Africa. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Please don't send me to Africa. Yeah, that's where you're going. Are you willing to go to Africa? And by God's grace, we went. See, what are you willing to give up tonight? The Lord may be interrupting your schedule, your business, your home, your work, whatever it may be. But Jesus is going to come to you. And he's going to come in the most practical way to the most practical thing. I mean, Peter's just mending his nets. It's a fishing business. By the way, you know, the fishermen, they were on the low end of the totem pole. In the villages, the only thing about lower than them was a sheep herder. And I can understand that. It's bad enough to smell like fish, but to smell like sheep, that's really bad. 
okay? And then lower than that, that really wasn't lower. They were very smart. They were certified public accountants, were tax collectors. They were dogs, like Matthew, okay? Isn't that what Jesus did with every one of those men? He came to right to where they were, and he met them right where they were at. Matthew's collecting money for the Romans and stealing from his kinfolk. Amen. He knew how to fudge the books. Rome said, we don't care what you get, just get what we want, and you can have the rest. Well, he sure took advantage of that. But right in that, Matthew, oh, follow me. Matthew got up and left his certified public account business. Every one of these guys, what's he doing? So the second question, so the first question is, will you give up your boat tonight, whatever that boat may be? The second question, Peter, now you've got to understand, get with me, get in the fishing business with me. We fished all night. We got a boat. We got a business. We got a couple partners. We're fixing our nets. We're on the seashore here. We're tired. We've worked hard all night. We've caught nothing. And, and, we've, and we've invested a lot of time in that. Amen? And Jesus says, Peter, will you give me your time? Will you give me your time? See, God asks for our time. But we all say, well, we got, we're too busy. I don't have time. And yet God asks for our time tonight. Now I want to commend all of you for being here tonight. All of you I see here tonight were here this morning. And you were all in Sunday school. So this is your third trip out here tonight. You have given God of your time. Unselfishly. Most of you that I see here tonight, matter of fact, all of you I see here tonight, will be here on Wednesday night. So when we were kids growing up, and some of you as well, you're called a Jesus freak, or a Jesus thumper, or a Bible thumper. Amen? But what are you doing? You have to start getting ready at home an hour or even earlier before you come. Then you get in your car, and you drive here, you may have to get gas, you're here for two, three hours on Sunday morning, you're here for at least three hours if you're here in Sunday school, amen, then you're back again tonight for another hour and a half, you're back again another Wednesday night, I mean, pray. what are you doing? Jesus says, hey, give me your time. And God bless you for giving of your time. Now, I'm, I understand there are people that are not able to come, don't, don't get me wrong, okay, please. I'm talking about those that are more than willing and able to come and can make it and don't. Okay? I'm not talking about people that are sick and hurt and, and, and have really good, good, good reasons. Not excuses, but reasons medically, physically, why they cannot be here. That's thoroughly understandable. But about the, those that can't. But thank you for coming, giving God your time. Now you've got to understand this conversation. Peter's saying, listen, man, uh, we've been fishing all night. That's in your study guide, by the way. We've been fishing all night. Lord, don't you understand? You talk about time. We're tired. We're wore out. We've worked hard. We've labored. We've caught nothing. Hey, listen, man, we just want to fix our nets and to get ready for tonight. But in the meantime, we're going to have a bite to eat, and then we're going to go take some nap time. Now, I know what it's like to work on the midship. So do you, David, don't you? Amen. And so, and, and so will Peter, the question is, will Peter give his time with the boat? See, see, the Lord said, I want the boat. Now he says, Peter, I want your time. So Peter, are you willing to give me your boat, your livelihood? Are you willing to give me your time? And listen, folks, when God asks you to give some, doesn't mean he's going to take it away forever. He just wants to know if you're willing. Are you willing to give it up? Are you willing to give it to the Lord? Are you willing to lay it down? Are you willing to, to, to whatever? Oh, boy, give me some time. See, is your time my time, or is it God's time? You see, your time and my time, church, needs to become his time in our daily lives, in our daily living, in our daily walk. So as you're going through this, the first one was, will you give me your boat? You had to answer yes or no. There's no maybe, I think so, or maybe so, or I'm not sure no, because that's a no answer. Okay, yes or no. Will you give the Lord some time? Yes or no? See, you're going to pass the test. Now, this is one of those tough ones, only five questions. So each test is worth uh, 20 points. So if you got the first two, you got 40 points. You're on your way to making, you haven't even made a, a D yet. Yeah, all right. 
Uh, so here we go. So now he comes along, and, and notice, a third question. Here's the third question. Peter, will you give me or yield me your will? When's the last time you've willed your will to the Lord? Lord, not my will, but thy will be done if we pray. If we go to James, James says, when we go, if we tell you, we're going to go here, we're going to do this, I'm going to do that. James says, no, no, here's what you say. If the Lord wills, we'll go here. If the Lord wills, we'll do this. And I've been trying to get myself in the habit out of everything. Even when I left tonight, I mean, this is what I do. And you say, this is ridiculous. No, I have a wonderful, beautiful Belgian dog at home, Belgian Malinois. I mean, I love that dog. God gave me that dog. No question about how God gave us that dog. Three wonderful stories about that dog. And I tell Caleb, I says, Mommy and Daddy, we'll be back tonight if the Lord wills. And I say, Lord, if we're not, please take care of him. If you don't mind, bring him with us. You know, Carol thinks Sadie's up there waiting for us. If she wants to think that, praise God. Amen, sweetie. Sadie up there? All right, she's running my rumble for me tonight. Amen. Ted's running our sound. Darlene's on the cameras. Praise God for these folks. Praise God for these folks. You know what they're doing? They're giving of their time. You know what they're doing? They're submitting their will to his will. Because, you see, their will tonight might want to be home with their loved one. Might want to be out doing something, going somewhere else, watching TV, having a picnic, a barbecue, going out on the lake. I don't know. We got lakefront property out here right now, so you can come out here and enjoy the lake. All right? But, no, what do they do? They surrendered their will to be here tonight and this morning and the earlier morning. And most of them will surrender their will to be here on Wednesday night. You see, Peter Will you yield your will to me? Now, see, when God does that sometimes, what is it what he wants to do? He's asking us, can we change our plans? See, you might have plans for this or for that, but God's got plans also. You see, and we're never going to carry out his plan unless we surrender to his will. My plan wasn't necessarily to go to Africa. My plan wasn't even necessary to come here. I have been candidating for six churches in Alaska, trying to land one. But it wasn't God's will, you see. And I'm glad that it wasn't. And yes, we came down here, and yes, we were broke. And, you know, uh, we was wondering, and God says, I got this covered, man. I'm going to take care of this. And okay, and he did. And then it was God's will for us to go to Ghana, West Africa. Not only once, but twice. To God be the glory. Wasn't necessarily my will. Some of you have heard my tape that I play for you, the fun one. Please don't send me to Africa. Y'all ever heard that one? That's good. I, mean, I love it. All right? You know, see, sometimes God wants to change your plans. Now, some of you got plans coming up. This week, next week, next month, next year. Sometimes we plan way in advance, don't we? And there's nothing wrong with that. But you ought to include God's will in it. God, is it your will that we go or do or be? Are you willing to surrender your will or is it just, no, this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to go do it? Well, you can have that attitude and take that approach, but you need to be careful with that. See, are you willing to change your plans for Jesus tonight? If so, he asked. Well, I've got someplace else I'm going to go with my boat. No, I want your boat. Well, Lord, I've got, I've got plans for time for this. No, I want your time. Lord, my will is to go over here. No, I want your will. I want you to accomplish my will. And by the way, you think about that. Peter, Peter argued a little bit with the wall. He said, he told the Lord, this is the wrong time to go fishing. Now, listen, I'm the professional fisherman. I have a fishing business. I have a boat. I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this a long time. We don't fish in the daytime. It's too hot. We fish at night. Okay? And we didn't catch nothing. This is the wrong time to go out in the boat and to launch the deep and catch fish. He's, he's debating this thing with the Lord. But see, it was the Lord's will to take the boat to go out in the deep and drop the net. 
See, that was the will of God. And he's going to be grateful and thankful he did the will of God. Amen? All right, but he didn't do it. This is the wrong time. I know what I'm doing. By the way, Jesus, let's get one thing straight. Master, I'm the fisherman. You're the carpenter. When the boat's got a hole in it, I'll call you to fix the boat. Isn't that what we do? We argue with God about everything. We want to reason it out and come up with all kinds of reasons why we can't give the boat, give our time, uh, surrender our will, because we've got all of this stuff going on. No, 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 no. Jesus asked him a question. In other words, he made a request to him. Peter, let down your net. Now think about it, church. What if Peter hadn't left down the net? Think about it. What if Peter hadn't given him his boat? What if Peter hadn't surrendered his will to him? Think about that. What if Peter hadn't said, okay, I'm tired, I'm weary, we're beat, we're, we're, we're worn out, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you some time. Oh, that's so sweet of you, Peter. See, that's what some of you think. You think, well, I'll give the Lord a little bit of time, and oh, that's just so, oh, isn't that, isn't that wonderful of me? Isn't that so wonderful of me that I gave the Lord 30 minutes this week? Oh, aren't you just so proud of me? Hallelujah, praise the Lord. I gave God 30 minutes. Oh, my. Oh, no. Let down your nets. Well, Peter continues. He protested. He protested. He said, now, listen. We have worked all night, and we've caught nothing. Now, they, they fish at night, and that's when they catch fish. Now, I wonder, is it surprising? And by the way, this message, when Jesus jumped in the boat and he was teaching them, then he said, all right, Peter, let's go here. This message was not for the crowd. This was a message for Peter. This whole message was for Peter. Peter, are you going to follow me? Peter, are you going to surrender to my will? Peter, are you going to live for me? Peter, are you going to give me your time? Peter, are you going to give me your trade? That's what I'm asking of you tonight. Peter had to make those decisions. He said, man, we worked all night. We caught, caught, haven't caught nothing. You see, because see, outside of the Lord's will, church, we can't do it. We can't do it. We've worked hard all night. We've toiled all night. We haven't caught a thing. I'm telling you, Master, we can't do it. But you see what we need to do? We need to take all your nets tonight. Whatever net that you have, take all your nets and put them into the will of God. Take all your nets and put them into the will of God. That's what Peter had to do. Third question he asked him. How'd you answer, yes or no? Will you give me your boat? Peter, will you give me your time? Will you give your will to Jesus? Let's look at a fourth question. Now, think about all this that's been going on with Peter and the Lord in this conversation about how we fish at night, and we, we've been worked all hard. We haven't caught nothing. You know, this is my business. I've got a boat. These are my partners. I mean, he's just going on and on with everything. Nothing wrong within itself because that's what he was. Now, he's not telling the Lord anything new because Jesus knew all that. But like us, we want to protest sometimes. Lord, I don't want to go. Lord, I don't want to do that. And sometimes we flat out just tell him, I'm not going to do that by our life, by our actions, by our will. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to obey you in this area. I will in this area, but not in this area. I'll give you this in here, but not over here. Well, folks, you've got to come to a place of total surrender. You know, you, God may not be calling you into the ministry, but you've still got to come to a place as a believer to total surrender of the Lord's will. And whatever God wants you to do, whatever God has for you, and I'll tell you what, there's no better place to be, in that, and that is, in, than in the perfect center of the perfect of God's will unless it's in his presence. No better place than to know that you are in the very center of the perfect will of God in your life than then to be in his presence. So Peter, oh Lord, I'm working hard. I got a business. This is my boat. These are my business partners. You know, these are the sons of, sons of thunder. We haven't caught anything, but, you know, we know what we're doing because we're fishermen, and I'm tired, I'm beat, I, I don't have time, and so forth and so on. And, and it goes on. And you know what he says to him? Peter, are you willing to yield your pride to me? See, folks, everybody in here has got pride. Did you know that? Everybody in here has pride. And let me tell you, God hates pride. 
He resisteth the proud and gives grace to the humble. Three things that God requires of man. That you do justly, love mercy, walk humbly before thy God. God's looking for humble people. Peter's got a little problem with pride just like many of us do. I can do this. I don't need any help. I'm a self-made man or woman. I made this business, created this business. And it goes on and on. I'm the best singer in the church. I'm the best piano player, best guitar player, best soloist. And we go on and on and on about how wonderful and how great we are. Hey, let me, let me tell you something. The Bible says that none of us are righteous. No, not one. The Bible says that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there's none that doeth good. No, not one. There's none righteous. The Bible says we've all gone out of our way and become unprofitable servants. Amen. These six sins does God hate in Proverbs. And yea, seventh is an abomination. The word abomination means detestable. God detests them. You know what the first one on the list is? A proud look. You know what the second one is? A lying tongue. You know why? Because when you say you don't have pride, you just lied. God, God knows what he's doing. God knows what, he, what he's writing. See, we've got a lot of pride. And see, God's never going to be able to use anybody that's full of themselves. See, when it's all about you and all what you've done and all what you've accomplished and you're so wonderful and so great and everything else, God cannot use you because you're not humble. God wants to use a humble servant. God resists it to proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Amen. So Peter, are you willing to yield to me your pride? Peter, I know you're a prideful man. You're a big fellow, you're a fisherman, you're choleric in your temperament. And we know that because Peter's always opened up his big mouth. He's always putting his foot in it. Lord, I'll die for you, you know, and you know all that is, and I'll never deny you, and blah, 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 it goes on and on, and what did he do? Denied him three times. I mean, you know, and so he's so full of pride, the Lord's going to deal with it. And let me tell you something, God will deal with your pride too, and he'll deal with my pride. See, there's no roosters around here, no, no roosters. They belong on the farm. I have two in my backyard that I deal with all the time, and we're going to have a baptismal service for them soon. Now we got one across the street, so we're going to have a triple baptismal. Amen. Okay? We got enough roosters. We have enough peacocks. The big peacock fan. They're beautiful. We have enough peacocks. We've got enough horn blowers. God's looking for some humble people, humble servants that are willing to give their boat. Amen? They're willing to give God some time. They're willing to give their will to the Lord, surrender their will. They're willing to yield their pride to the Lord. So the Lord's uh, testing Peter here because that was the fourth question to the test. Peter, will you give me your pride? And remember, he told him, man, we've been working all night. We're fishermen, blah, blah, blah. You don't work at night. You don't go fishing in the daytime, you know, the whole nine yards. But so anyway, nevertheless, at thy word, and we've preached a message on that, but nevertheless, I'm going to go uh, in this protest. Isn't that what a lot of us do sometimes? I mean, let's be truthful. We know God speaks to our heart, tells us, wants to do something, wants us to go somewhere or give something or whatever, and we go, yeah, and we wrestle with it, and we debate it, and we protest. Then finally, we give in. All right, God, nevertheless, uh, we'll do it. Oh, don't take that attitude. Man, do it right away. Do it with a right heart attitude and a right motive and a, and a love in your heart for Christ, for what he's done for you and what he's given to you. Folks, we never can repay him for everything he's done for us. Never. Never. And we owe him everything. We owe him our lives. Amen? Man, the fact that you're saved tonight, the fact that your sins are forgiven tonight, the fact that your name's written down in glory tonight, the fact that your name's in the Lamb's book of life tonight, man, we owe God everything. And it's not going to hurt if God asks something of us, to give him something, to do something for him. Peter was working as hard as he could uh, to contain. He was working so hard he couldn't contain the fish. This is Peter now. Remember, Peter, you go let down the net. He didn't tell the other fellows. He told Peter. See, this is a message for Peter. Peter, go let the net down. And boy, as soon as he did, it's amazing. More fish in the net than they could hold. Now, they couldn't catch anything all night. You know why? Because God had all this planned. God told the fish that night, just keep on sleeping. I got a job for you tomorrow. I got a fisherman I'm going to work with. So just get prepared because it's coming. Peter let down the net, and he let down the net. And when he did, the fishies jumped in the net. 
God spoke to the fish. Get in the net. Oh, you don't think so? He spoke to another fish to swallow up a backslidden preacher by the name of Jonah. Amen. Then he spoke to that fish again and said, puke him out. And out he puked him out on the beach. He hit a running. Made a three-day journey in less than a day. Went in the net of a priest, ate words, and they got whole revival broke out. And they still got mad. Oh, my. <laughs> oh. And guess what happens? The nets start to break. The boat starts to sink. So Peter, in all of his pride, help, help somebody help me. I need some help. Somebody help me. Church, we can't do the ministry all by ourselves. We can't do all the work by ourselves. We need help. We need help in everything we do around here. Everything this church does around here, every, any ministry at all around here takes help and workers and people. We need to help. Don't ever take the attitude that you can do it all by yourself because you can't. Peter thought he was a self-made fisherman. He had all the answers. He's going to debate. He's going to argue about it. He's going to tell the Lord, the master, how to fish. Man, he's the fish. Jesus is a fisherman. I need some help. Peter called for some helping hands. We need some helping hands. Every one of us needs helping hands. Don't you be so prideful that you're afraid to ask somebody to help. When you have a time of need, ask for help. There are people standing by and willing and ready to help. Come and get you something, take you something, take you somewhere, do something. But you have to ask. Don't be so prideful. Be willing to ask for help. Peter, are you willing to yield your pride? Because, boy, if you don't, you're going to be in some deep trouble real quick. Your boat's going to sink. Amen? And then the Lord's probably going to ask him, how long can you tread water, Peter? I don't know how deep the Sea of Galilee is, but I imagine it's pretty deep in some places. Some holes down there deep where the fishies were sleeping all night. Down in the cool water and the shade and the shadows. And the Lord just put them to sleep. Now, fellas, get ready for tomorrow because it's going to be a different thing at daylight. Oh, isn't it amazing what God does, isn't it? The fifth question tonight in the test. Peter, will you give me your love? Peter, will you give me your love how many remember when Jesus asked Peter that question Peter do you love me now why did he ask him well I'd like to say because Peter denied him three times so hey you know fair is fair right so the Lord asked him Peter do you love me yea Lord thou knowest I love you now remember in the Greek there were two different words here Jesus asked Peter Peter do you agape me it's agape love Peter had answered, yea, Lord, I phileo you, brotherly love. Peter asked him again, Peter, do you love me? Agape, do you agape love me? Peter again answers, yea, Lord, you know that thou, you know everything. You know I love you, phileo, brotherly love. The third time, Jesus used a different Greek word. He said, Peter, do you phileo me? And Peter answered, yea, Lord, thou knowest I phileo you, brotherly love. Three times he asked him. Peter, give me your love. Will you give me your love, Peter? Will you give me your love, Peter? You see, if you love me, Peter, you won't have a problem giving me your boat. Hello? Peter, if you love me, you won't have a problem giving me some time. Peter, if you really love me, you'll be willing to give your will to me, just surrender your love to me, you're real. Peter, if you really love me, you'll be willing to yield your pride to me and let me help you. Peter, will you give me your love? Now in your notes, you'll see there they left and followed Jesus. And then you know what Peter does. Peter falls down at his feet and says, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Aren't you glad that God loves sinful men? Aren't you glad that God still wants to use us even though we're sinful men and women? Aren't you? Isn't that great? And then, boy, were they surprised with all the fishies they caught. 
Now, this isn't the end of it, the story. The greater part of the story is right about now. Jesus gives Peter a new job. You're going to get a new job, Peter. From this time on, you're going to be a fisher of men. That's going to be your new job. Now, if you read the scripture there, you notice what I said up in the beginning. They left and followed Jesus. Under Peter, will you love me? But the scripture tells us here in the end, they left all. They left all on the beach to follow Jesus. Who? Peter, James, and John. They all, they left all. Even though the main direction was to Peter. But Peter finally in his submission to the will of God surrendered his boat to him. Okay? Surrendered his time to him. Even though he was tired and wore out and worked hard and had caught nothing and and so forth. He yielded his will. Nevertheless, at thy word. In other words, Peter says, I will. I I will give you the boat. I'll give you some time, Lord. Let's go out into the deep. Let's launch down the nets. I'll give you all of that. His result was, Peter passed the test for the third time. You'll see in Matthew 4, 19, he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Here we come over here a third time. Peter, interesting. Three times he meets Peter. Three times he asked him, do you love me? God likes threes, okay? By the way, the number of three in the Bible is the number of grace. <sighs> the grace of God. Yes. Praise the Lord. Oh, my goodness. Peter, James, John. You see the effect it had on the other two men? Because Peter surrendered, gave him his boat, gave him his time dropped the net, called out for some help. And the Bible said they all left the beach and followed Jesus. See, we don't know the effect we're going to have on people that are watching our lives and looking at us when God talks to us. Oh, my, what a a beautiful story here that they all left and followed Jesus. That's amazing. Just amazing with these guys, what they did. Left it all. Gave it all. Now just think about it for a minute with me. Just think now. Sometimes you're thinking, you're saying, well, if it wasn't Peter, God had James and John John standing right there. He could have done it. No, this was to Peter. You say, well, God's got somebody else that can do it. Not necessarily. See, if God's got a job for you to do, He wants you to do it. God has a calling in your life. He wants you to answer the calling. Not somebody else. You see, God wants you to give something. He wants you to give it, not somebody else. You see, just think. If Peter had not surrendered his boat, his time, his will, his pride, and given his love, you know what? We wouldn't be reading First and Second Peter in the New Testament because he wrote First and Second Peter. We wouldn't have seen 3,000 get saved on the day of Pentecost. We wouldn't have seen four, five thousand men four chapters later in the book of Acts get saved, count men and women and children, if Peter had not surrendered and passed the test. We would not have what we have today. Matter of fact, we would not have the gospel had Peter not surrendered. Because you remember what happened at the church of Galatia. He got down there and got tied up with the Gnostics and all of them and got in there and started believing their circumcision, that you couldn't be saved without circumcision and so forth. And Paul says, hey, you get me a bed ready. I'm coming to see you because we're going to get something straightened out with doctrine. And Paul went down and straightened Peter out on his doctrine. And as a result, we got the gospel. Why? Because one man said, okay, God, I surrender all. You can have my boat. You can have my time. You can have my will. You can have my pride. And you can have my love. And the Lord said, okay, Peter, you passed the test. A, 100% plus. Did you pass the test tonight? 
What is it that God's asking you to give tonight? What is it in the will that you're struggling with tonight for his will? You struggling with pride tonight? Give up your boat, whatever it is. Maybe God's not asking you to give up the boat itself. But maybe he's asking you to give up what's in the boat. Amen? I don't know. But I know this. Peter's one happy camper. See, church will never be happy and satisfied until we completely obey the Lord's will. And we surrender to his will, to his calling, to his bidding, whatever it is that he's asking us to do. No matter how big or how small, and, and, and in one sense, this was, this was nothing. You know, ah, come on, come on, let's go do something else besides catch fish. Matter of fact, Peter, I'm going to give you a promotion. Huh? I'm going to give you a promotion, brother. Such a promotion that you won't even be able to handle it. It's going to be awesome. You're going to get a new name, which you got. You're going to write two books of the New Testament for me, which he did. You're going to preach and 8,000 souls are going to start the First Baptist Church of Antioch or Jerusalem, either way, amen? Yeah, you're going to work with the other apostles to establish the, the doctrine that, that everything is built on, the doctrine of the apostles? Oh my goodness, all of this because Peter surrendered. Oh, he fought it for a little bit. He argued about it. He protested a little bit. And isn't that what we, you and I do all the time? Lord, I don't want to go there. Lord, I don't want to do that. Lord, I don't want to give this up. Lord, I, oh, come on, please. You got to be kidding me. Or God, don't you have another plan? God had a plan for 12 men to change the world, and they did it. When Jesus went back to glory, the angels said, now what's going to happen? What, and, and they said, well, I've, I'm counting on 12 men down there to take the gospel, to evangelize the world. Angel said to Jesus, well, what if they don't? Do you have another plan? Jesus said, no, I don't have another plan. I'm counting on those men. And those men came through. Is God counting on you and I tonight to carry out his plan and his will? Does he say to you tonight, he said, no, I'm counting on Sharon. I'm counting on Juanita. And I'm counting on Jerry there and George and Cindy and, and, and Ray and, and, and Debbie and, and Steve and, and Eden and, and D Dave over here and, and Ted and uh, Carol and, and uh, what's her name? Uh, yeah, Darlene. Amen. No, I'm counting on them. And I hope God can count on you and I. And for those of you that are watching by way of Rumble and Facebook, I hope you're still with us. God's counting on you tonight. Yeah, he is. What's God wanting for you to give up tonight? What's he asking you to give up? Could be something light, could be something big, I don't know. But are you willing to give up your boat? Or perhaps what's in the boat? Are you willing to give of your time to the Lord tonight? Are you willing to give of your love? Are you willing to give up your pride? Are you willing to give uh, uh, your will to him and surrender it? What is it? Did you pass the test tonight? Each question is worth 20 points. How many did you get? How'd you do? Well, Peter, aren't you glad Peter came around? I'll tell you what, you'll never be more happier and satisfied than when you come around and you pass the test. And you know, this is what's so neat about it. God started a work in you, whatever that work is. And you know what I like about it? No matter what I've done or how messed up, messed up I've done, God says, I began a work in you, and he said, I will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the time in your words. This is a little story about a fisherman in a boat and some fishies. But directed to a man that struggled with his will, his pride, his love, his time, his possessions. Lord, I pray we learn something from it tonight. I'm praying that we'll learn that whatever it is that you've laid on our hearts tonight that you want and ask of us to give up. To our surrender our will, whatever it may be. Our time, however much time it, ma it doesn't matter. Our will, to your will. 
Lord, lay aside our pride. We all have it. And Father, for our love for you, thank you for this little story about a fisherman named Peter. Father, thank you for the message of your word tonight. I pray it's been a blessing to those that have watched my Facebook and Rumble and later we'll watch it later on YouTube and, and then on the website and then later on they'll even see it on television and the radio. Father, may you use it to be a blessing, to be a help. It might have an impact on the lives of those that may hear it. For those of you that are really listening intently tonight, what is it that God wants you to give up to come to Christ? That's the main thing and the most important thing. That you'd be willing to lay aside, give up, whatever it is, and come to Christ. To come to Jesus tonight, whatever it is. We pray that that may be your heart's desire, that you would come to Christ. Invite Him into your heart and life to be your Lord and your Savior. And Father, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. And thanks again for letting us be here tonight. Lord, we didn't have to come. We get to come. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you for the crowd tonight. For the small group, Lord, bless them. Bless them. Father, may your grace be upon them. All your favor, Lord. May your peace rule and reign in their hearts that passes all understanding. May your countenance shine upon their faces. For they've been in the presence of the Lord this evening. Because where two or more are gathered in your name, you're in the midst. Now, Lord, as we go from this place, church, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And may he cause his face to shine upon you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. The Bible says that my righteousness, any righteousness that I have, is as filthy rags. And those filthy rags that he's talking about were the rags that they wrapped uh, the arms and the people's heads and bandages of what was what they called wet and, and running uh, leprosy. It was wet leprosy, the pus rags of, of wet leprosy, not dry leprosy, but wet leprosy. God says your righteousness is as filthy as that. And leprosy was a type or picture of sin. And so God says your righteousness is as filthy as sin. Well, I don't want to hear that. Because I love you, I tell you the truth. I hope I don't become your enemy. Because you see, when you know the truth, church, you will be free. You be, the truth will make you free, and the truth will set you free. And Jesus went down a few verses later in John there, and he says, and the truth, and if you have the truth, you shall be free indeed. He didn't come politically. He didn't come socially. He didn't come for, he came for one purpose, and that was to die. He was born to die. Simeon come tonight, and we're going to see the prophecy of that of Simeon. He was born to die, to go to a cross, and therefore those gauze, uh, those swaddling clothes were symbolic of his death. And that's why when the wise men came and they presented him with gold, that's kingship. They presented him with frankincense. That's the high priest. Watch this. He's king. He's high priest. But they also presented him with myrrh because he would go to the cross and die and resurrect as the king of kings and the Lord of lords to the glory of God. Hallelujah.